Saint de Bouillon. Details later. Uh, now, in, in that, with that tool, uh, he was able to do very powerful things, and uh, uh, still working on it. For example, we heard him talk about the uh, finiteness, the, the man for money conjecture, the daily man for money conjecture uh, by Benjamin. Um, on, on counting the number of points, for example, of the curve. Uh, of, uh, on a, uh, the number of points of final order on a curve inside its Jacobian. And, um, and, and Alex is able to use this I made derivation, so um, by descending um, over the uh, field of characteristic P uh, to do this kind of counts very effectively. So that's the reason, uh, one reason. The other reason is that we were looking at completely, algebraically completely integrable systems. So let me set up that, um, that scenario. So in uh, the classical case, you have, um, you know, a Hamiltonian system called the Euler tau. which uh, nowadays we, we call algebraically completely integrable. And uh, I just abbreviate ACI for a Hamiltonian system, uh, which has the following property. The, the system is completely integrable as a Hamiltonian, but moreover, the orbits of, of motion um, are linear, linearized on the Euclidean variety. So, um, in this context, the system is set up in a classical way as follows, and I'll give the details here because we do need the equation. So, I will start with, with the following: uh, that a b a element which is non-zero when I put it across. On top of, of anything, it means the invertible element. Uh, and K is a delta field. And um, then K I are constants. So they are in K delta. And in a classical case, you can take K equals R. And to phrase it as an ACI, it's more conventional to take the complex numbers because then everything becomes a variety of a naturally closed field. K, K delta or K? Sorry. K, K delta or K? K delta. K delta. I think it's K up or delta, is that right? Yeah. yeah. R or C. Oh. I think it's the same thing, and um, yeah, I think then the derivation is the natural one. 
Yeah. Thank you very much. It's a legitimate question about rotation. It's important now. <laughs> and so this is just a motivation stage. Uh, and the uh, equations, equations are um, uh, now the top is set up in this place, but the uh, center of gravity is fixed, so it has two degrees of freedom. Uh, and the derivative of x1 is a times a2 minus a3 x2, x3, and just to save time, I'll say, etc. Now, of course, you want to know the, the correct signs, but they don't matter for the intellectual uh, purposes of the proof. Um, so that x2 is a times a3 minus a1, x3, x1, etc. Delta one derivation here? Delta is one derivation, thank you. And in fact, it's going to be that delta. And let me tell you what F is. The first time I did not set you by F. So F is A of X1, X2, X3, X1, X2, X3. But this is on the other one. Uh, and however, when you Book. Um, Alex had proved that um, 
a strong normality is equivalent to weak normality plus non-movable singularities. And so this is now a strongly normal extension. So his idea. And I bet you mean that your, your f is the is is function it? field, okay? Yeah, but it's f equipped with these differential equations. Yes. Yeah. So it's f with the connection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Differential field. So, um, so because this is not good, here is the natural idea. So you introduced H1, which is visible, uh, which is the sum AI. X times K, lowercase x, uh, from 1 to 3. The Hamiltonians, the commuting Hamiltonians. At H2, which is the sum i 1 to 3 of x i squared, and you say, if you're Alex, um, it, is, it is brilliant, um, but rather tangible, that if I define the field L, equals k of h1 h2 then f over l is a delta function here of genus 1 with no movable singularity Singularities at infinity in, in this in this new uh, new uh, view of the extension and uh, also that if you define this elliptic curve by the following equations um, e sub c is defined by um, h i equals c i where c i are where ci is our constants, k delta, uh, then this derivation, just one derivation, um, sends the sheaf of, the regular sheaf of EC into itself. And so you have to check. And so you got your strong up, strongly normal extension. Now, uh, just one word. Um, since 1986, uh, I mean, this was not his priority, obviously, but Alex was not, um, uh, did not uh, check that such a, this type of, of um, correspondence or trans transliteration of an ACI into a differential algebra uh, language uh, setting was possible for every ACI and, um, and so this is the project we are, um, we are also tackling uh, but only in the classical case and, uh, and we think we have a, a proof. Um, he's, you know, he's stuck because he had done this in a very ad hoc way and he had to check that all the right objects had no singular points at, um, at infinity in this new projective, uh, projectivization in this um, context. So, um, so hopefully this will be true for every ACI. But as we started looking at that, he started looking again, um, thinking again about the possible um, way to phrase the algebraic complete integrability in the arithmetic setting. And this is what we have, I should say, for just one example. So now I will be more precise, but the notation for, um, 
for these functions, we remain the same. So now what we have so far is only a PI coiler top uh, that is taken out. So how do you do that? And I think hopefully that's, that's neat. Um, okay. So here's what we want to ask. We want to replace A by any A provided it's a DDR, discrete graduation ring, or a field. Now, yeah, I already want to say where 2 is in invertible. And then, the, you want to introduce variables. So, let me try to read these equations. The equations at least. And, and the numbers A I I's will be the same. And I erase the, the Hamiltonians, which will be the same. Variables um, again, uh, lowercase x, and so you define the affine space say, to, to be spec of A, x1, x2, x3, uh, and then you want uh, A2, so the plane, which is spec A, z1, z2. important to have an 
expectation for the inclusion is sub I sub C from E C to the space A D. Okay. Now you want to define because that's where the idea is. So first, I know Z1, Z2. So Z1, Z2 are basically the, the constant values of the Hamiltonian, right? Uh, so this is rather natural uh, thing to do, but it looks like how to do blue as the product I from 1 to 3, Z1 minus AI, Z2. And uh, uh, therefore, it's in the polynomial link A of Z1, Z2. And um, you want to assume that M C1, C2, so of these values, is invertible in A. Because that basically is the discriminant of the curve, and so you want the curve to be smaller. Okay. And then, uh, okay, so, so I had this thing uh, more rigorously phrased, but I think I'll suppress uh, this statement and just tell you that um, we are dealing with analytic curve because I really had to write it more rigorously later anyway. And uh, then you have a global. Check that you have a global homomorphic one form omega C, let's call it, and we call it the canonical one form on EC. And I want to tell you the equations, and it's a pull back under high C of dx1 over a2 minus a3 uh, x2 x3. Uh, and then you write it um, as an equal sign using the the other you know the other coordinates. So dx2 over the appropriate polynomial in x1, x3, etc. And this was the way that it the um, algebraic complete integrability was proved classically, that you constructed um, solutions to the Euler top as elliptic functions. Okay, so far so good. So then uh, we have an notation for the projective closure E sub C star um, in P3, which is branch in T0, T3 with um, Xi being Ti over T0. So this is projective closure. And we call the canonical holomorphic form on E star C that reduces to, um, that restricts to omega C um, with the same method, omega C. Okay, now this is going to be the idea. Now you introduce two more indeterminates, two more variables. If you consider the following polynomial <coughs> f z1, z2, so these are going to be the constant values, but it's going to pay off to let them vary in, make generic statements, and here we put x. Uh, so therefore it's a polynomial in a x, um, excuse me, z1, z2, x. And it's defined as follows, a2 minus a3 times x squared plus z1 minus a2 z2 times a3 minus a1 x squared minus z1 plus a1 z2. Before you ask, no, there are no typos. 
<laughs> it looks a bit weird, but it's a weighted polynomial, which is homogeneous of degree of weight 4. in Z1, Z2, X, where Z1 and Z2, of course, have degree 2 because they are the Hamiltonians and X has degree 1. So basically, we really need to write the elliptic curve as, you know, y squared equals X to the fourth times something, uh, plus something. Why? Because now I'm going to go into the arithmetic um, category. Uh, but not before saying, that if you look at this elliptic curve and call it EC prime, which is now the spec of A x y uh, over y squared minus f c1 c2 x, right? So it's an elliptic, it's an honest elliptic curve. Y squared equals something. Uh, a four the degree polynomial will be four in X. Then you have a morphism from E C to E C prime. And you check that this is a degree two isogeny. Okay. <laughs> but that's very important. And the full mark of dx over y, you know dx over y, guess what that full back is? the canonical one form, okay? So they're basically the same thing. But you see um, what wonderful thing Alex did with this polynomial f, okay? The ingredients are all here. an arithmetic um, differentiation is, uh, you know, in case you don't work in. Actually, uh, maybe it was recalled this morning, so maybe I shouldn't, but I'll try to be quick. So in the classical case, the way that you phrase the uh, ACI is the following. You say, well, I checked that e a well, h1 is zero for, um, excuse me, the two Hamiltonians have um, derivative zero. And then you check that uh, every time uh, the elliptic curve is smooth and c1, c2 is different from zero, um, the um, Canonical differential paired with this uh, differentiation is one. Okay, and so this says that there actually it would be more rigorous to denote it by del sub c because you are restricting to um, the locus of h i equals zero. Del sub c um, is linearized on the elliptic curve. This is the algebraic way to phrase the classical ACI. And this will be the way that when I define the arithmetic differentiation, we will check that we have a complicated system in the new um, setting. But that does not make sense in arithmetic, Alex says. So what makes sense in arithmetic is the following equivalent condition. <laughs> and I'll omit a little bit of details, okay? I'll just say what the idea is. The equivalent condition is that C omega C is zero, where this is the derivative along the vector field, okay? So, so this is a little bit um, needs more words. <laughs> it's not wrong, but you know. Needs a little bit more. Just the basic, the basic 
seem to need it already, but um, so let's say that P is not zero in B. It's a prime number. That's the, the prime number P. And then, um, well, you know, maybe I should omit this because it's a natural notation, but X hat is the formal spectrum of B hat. And the uh, definition, a Frobenius lift B is a green homomorphism from B to B. Let's uh, say it's a phi uh, upper B, which mod P is the Frobenius. Then we say that D uh, 
you know, acting on the rainbow functions of X is a, an arithmetic flow. So this is really what we regard as an arithmetic flow. So you have to have a, a big elevation in that sense on the rainbow. Okay, so the, you know, the name of the game is this uh, uh, Frobenius property. Okay. 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 So the, the example. So when uh, when you have a notation, F is the uh, residue field. Because I should have said that from now on, from now on, A is a complete DVR. From now on, and F is the residue field. <coughs> then um, the example is that when F is just a, a P, there will be elements, um, and A is um, the PR integers, um, the only there is a unique Frobenius left, uh, which is the identity. And so the attendant del, uh, derivation is dx equals phi x minus x to the p over p. Uh, and so it, this is uniqueness. Uh, and so it's uh, x minus x to the p over p. And so uh, this is Alex's idea and uh, uh, what he did so much. isogeny of degree two, that's the way we make sure that in our case, for our F, the Hasse invariant is non zero. Okay? And so the final uh, observation that we need is that in our case, um, and um, in our case, we, we know. Uh, Remember that M C1, C2 was invertible in A, and so we check that A, P minus 1 of C1, C2, which means F of C1, C2, X is, is non zero. Having said that, 
empiristi arithmetic oil of flow. I think I just had time for that, but I think it's uh, enough to give you a flavor. Uh, there exists an, an arithmetic flow then x on x hat such that one in O x hat del x of h1 equals del x of h2 equals zero and two. Now we should say for all c1, c2 in um, in a2. I should say which are constants, so such that del uh, applied to C1 and C2 is zero, and such that n C1, C2 is invertible, and C1, C2 times A, P minus one, C1, C2 is in A invertible, that's what I just said, the Frobenius lift that C corresponding to this arithmetic flow for which we have existence uh, is such that This is what the arithmetic flow is. Okay. Now, how do we show that this um, arithmetic flow exists? We construct it by using the equations explicitly. We constructed the equation. Then, okay, we constructed one. How many are there? So this is another very neat fact. They are a homogeneous space under a a linear space, and what's that linear space? The Hamiltonians for the classical Euler system. So you could take any other Hamiltonian, uh, which was, which had for some bracket equal zero with the given Hamiltonians, and set it equal to constant, and this vector space parameterizes the possible arithmetic flows. There are no others. And uh, um, I don't have time to write down the definition for this one which we construct. It's very, very natural, um, but a little bit um, complicated. And it's written in terms of the coefficients of unity curve in x and y coordinates. So you can see why we are um, not even thinking of any possible generalization to other ACIs because it really uh, came down to this, I think, a miracle, at least that uh, I think Alex agrees with me, I hope I'm not misrepresenting, uh, of using the Hass invariant of that polynomial and showing that it's not identically zero. It's an indeterminate. There isn't one, but had not 
one, found one that he was satisfied with. Uh, and then we started playing with the Hamiltonians, and then he was very happy because, uh, you know, we just constructed this using the, the Hamiltonians, the two quadratic Hamiltonians. What is really amazing is the way the Hass invariant for this polynomial works. Uh, you have to, uh, you know, you have to check this, these things which seem harmless to me, but I, they're pretty big. You have to check that under this isogeny, the differentials correspond. And once you have written the elliptic curve as a board, it's just so natural to define this periodic uh, derivation, this periodic flow, which, uh, no, I don't know what it means. <laughs> What, what did you say they were torsed or under again? Or what did I say? You, you said the lifts of Fermius were torsed or under something, some linear space, but you just gave it a description. There's a last statement you made at the end of the theorem. Yeah. You said, you, yeah, they were, they, you said all the flows were parametrized by, oh, well, you didn't write it down. Yeah. Parametrization, you know, needs a separate theorem with, with the long proof also. But that, that was really we started asking, and so let me just, uh, you know, just write two words. How many? And so there is another theorem. This is one and then the other. And then there is another one in the middle. That's why I don't call them one and two, uh, in which we check um, on which points of the projective space there is these flows have a singular, singularity, which they do in the periodic case. But um, theorem B says that the all possible arithmetic flow Tensor with um, the residue field of it. So, so the bar object is the tensor of the object of the small p. So, there is another thing. Okay. Let's think our speaker one more time. 